highway as, um, authority money through MnDOT in addition Thank to you, Sedman, Federal Andy Transit Hoover. Authority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, moving down, um, we have someone listed as Queen. Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Good morning, council members and chair. Um, my name is Queen. I am at 1041 James Avenue North. Um, I am here in support of uh, these neighborhood, Harrison's neighborhood, Jordan's neighborhood, but also um, I'm also with One Family, One Community, and we are just in support of, of uh, what Harrison has uh, proposed here uh, for the blue line. We would also like to see, uh, as stated earlier, with the new housing development, that there should be a minimum of 30% of the units as affordable housing options with the number of units and rents reflecting what the neighborhood and the demographics of the current uh, area of medium income. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ayan uh, Issey. Good morning, uh, the councilor and chairs. Uh, my name is Ayan Issey. I, I am a uh, Person neighborhood associate, uh, living in uh, Park Balaza uh, for 10 years. Uh, my concern today is I represent the Somali community, uh, Women Child Safe Center, the organization. The safety number one, uh, uh, the Park Balaza, they don't have uh, the camera in outside of this because uh, we've seen many times they steal the cars, and uh, we need uh, to have a safety camera. Also, they don't have a car mobility. Of We have uh, elder people living there, and they need the grocery shopping, and there is no grocery in Aram to the uh, area. Uh, the closest one is the Broadway and Lindo, which is a cab food. Everybody goes to the uh, South Minneapolis to look for uh, grocery shopping. So we will look for uh, safety of, about the business. And we have a mosque also. Uh, the, we want it to be perceived to be like a similar the opportunity they have the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I will now go to uh, Sean Pierce. Please come forward, state your name and address for the record. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, good morning and thank you, Chair and Council Members. Uh, I am Sean V.T. Pierce. I'm the Executive Director at the Harrison Neighborhood Association. Uh, you've heard pretty much everything from our residents today. I want to review a little bit of our engagement and some of the key points as we move forward. Uh, first, thank you to Jim Vole and Sophia Guinness. They've been with us for a very long time. Um, and Commissioner Higgins, who is not here today that I see, uh, but for the for the last three or so years has really been sitting with Harrison residents, even when we were discussing a pedestrian overpass over Trunk Highway 55. Um, just a bit of our work, we were a part of the community working group in the station area process, the health equity and engagement cohort. We have membership on the CAC, the BAC, and we were at the TAC um, meetings. So this is not uh, a new level of engagement for us. I wanna be clear about that. I also serve on a corridor management committee and we were happy to have representation on the Met Council's equity advisory selection committee. So very well engaged. We make sure that residents know what's happening uh, and our board members are here to show you all that we are not speaking as sole staff, but we really represent the voices of our neighborhood. Uh, in addition to what residents have raised, I want to just make a note that in addition to the the door knocking we've done, we've hosted over 45 meetings in the last year and a half about this particular line as well as Southwest. Uh, an additional 20 rounds of door knocking, we've kept the West Market Business District up to date before they were even started and officially recognized and encouraged their participation at the table on Blue Line and Southwest LRTs because we um, also understand it is essential that our businesses have a voice at the table. So when you've heard residents uh, and staff reference this investment in the current housing and business stock, we want to we want to really uh, lift that up. If you look at some of the work that Robbinsdale is doing, they're they're acknowledging that when we when we build new structures, we actually start to price our people out, 
right? Because some of these properties are already owned and then you add in taxes and mortgages. And now uh, we go from looking at maybe eight or $900 to lease these if you're a small business to potentially $2,000 a month just to cover what the, what the property owner has incurred in order to own property. So we wanna make sure that when we talk about displacement, we're also talking about making sure that the people who have been invested in these communities as our business owners, as our residents, both renters, um, and homeowners, and as um, our faith-based communities continue to to uh, to be in our neighborhoods, uh, we ask that the council support the the project. But we also ask that you really um, press that there is an increase in the crossing time, at least double. People get stuck out there all of the time. And to give you an idea of what happens, uh, there was construction on Olson at some point, and in a one-minute time span, I sat on uh, Glenwood and I counted 56 cars. And that was a small bit of construction. So imagine what happens when we start tearing up these lanes. We need infrastructural investment on Glenwood and we need those increased uh, crossing times. Uh, we also wanna make sure that we're clear, this is not a commuter rail. When we say that, we mean this is not for the nine to five people, but really acknowledging that this is about connecting our communities all the way up to the Brooklyn's and then making sure people can get out to some of our largest employment hubs um, out in Southwest. So that North and South piece is huge. And the piece about us not being an extension of downtown is that Harrison is the only environmental justice community that's impacted by all three of the lines. So please keep that in mind and really encourage the project office and our, and our partners to uh, increase the, the access and the infrastructural investments to the community. Cool. And we always take questions and we welcome you to our community engagement efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that testimony and commentary. Um, I will now go to call um, Apostle Anitha. Uh, please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Anitha. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair and Council Members. Thank you. That's uh, Apostle Anatha. <laughs> okay, just um, looking at and listening to everyone speaking here. I'm a pastor at uh, 500 Newton Avenue North of the Lee Church International Ministries. Uh, and uh, we're just speaking on behalf of generally what everyone else has already said. Uh, we're here in support of community. So as the elderly spoke about uh, the winter months and the cold and, 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 and being able to have those uh, barriers for them, uh, they spoke about the trees and the pollution, um, the five-story buildings, uh, limitations, the businesses and their help, uh, the housing and affordable housing, 30% uh, for jobs. They spoke about that, the green space, uh, the garden importance. Um, the clean uh, uh, air uh, for the trees, uh, and, and in that respect, uh, safer intersections, uh, the discrimination situation, uh, that filing, uh, the safety for the cars and the stealing, that situation, and then the financial costs uh, for businesses and renters. All of that you all have to look at and um, negotiate and, and, and figure out how you're going to really, you know, uh, work with the community and help each one in their respected ideas and, and, and concerns. And so here as a church, we are uh, here to support the community uh, through our uh, standing with the community and um, working to see that uh, these things are, are met as uh, most possible, in the most possible way. Uh, also that uh, we really be concerned about uh, the demographics of the uh, area being mainly with 65% uh, African American and um, creating more jobs uh, through this uh, construction. Uh, normally, uh, when I go past construction sites, I very seldom see African Americans uh, on these construction sites. So, with this major uh, construction and uh, light rail, we also want to see more African Americans uh, employed through this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, that's the last person on the list that I have. Any subsequent sign-ins? Uh, seeing none, are there anyone who, anyone who wishes to come forward? Make commentary and wish to come forward. Uh, seeing none, I will close the public hearing portion of this. And um, council members, any 
questions or comments here yeah. come from our vendor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, along with you and Councilmember Glidden, I have the opportunity to be on the rail policy group. So those of us there were able to see some of the more detailed development of this project, but I wondered if we might be able to have CPED staff just very briefly um, talk with us about the other consequence of this um, um, decision about the lane um, widths and number of lanes, which is the redevelopment potential along the corridor. And our staff did a significant amount of work and analysis. Um, and I think that's just an important part of this conversation. Uh, again, we have a proposal in front of us. Um, today's the day we vote on municipal consent and it's not likely to change the outcome, but I do think it's important that the community members that took the time to come and, and those in the broader community know about some of these other trade-offs as well. So I think we have Mr. Byers and Mr. Rule here who both were really involved in that. And again, I think it could be very brief. Yeah. Well, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Byers. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Council Members. My name is Jack Byers, Manager of Long Range Planning and CPED. Um, and to your question, Council Member Bender, um, we have done a lot of work and analysis on this, particularly in relation to the station area planning, uh, which is um, going on cooperatively with um, the um, engineering part of the project. As you know, um, Minneapolis has been part, this is the fourth light rail line that Minneapolis has been part of. So these are significant investments in the city, significant investments in the region. And the vision has always been uh, that transit oriented development would happen at our stations and that the stations would be a place of mixed use development that would allow for connectivity between the neighborhoods and the region vis-a-vis -vis the rail stations. I don't have to tell you that this has been a bit of a challenge to um, realize on some of the other lines. The Hiawatha line uh, was built quickly and um, the redevelopment on the east, sorry, on the western side of the Hiawatha line had happened in the decade previous to the construction of that line. On the eastern side, there's a lot of industrial and rail uses that made it much more difficult, have made it much more difficult to redevelop. Likewise, on the southwest, there are varying conditions between industrial and polluted lands and then lakes and parks as well. Um, on Central Carter, there's been better opportunities um, for redevelopment, and that's because the line has been built in a narrower um, uh, public realm, a uh, public realm that has been designed to really connect neighborhoods um, on either side of the line rather than the line being a barrier. So these are the kinds of things that CPED began to look at um, with Metro Transit, with um, MnDOT, and with Hennepin County um, as the project was in design. The chief opportunity on this line that we did not have with all of the others is that there's a great deal of land available here for redevelopment, which means that there are a number of developer opportunities at both the Van White and the Penn stations. More importantly, the majority of that land is in public ownership. And that means that that land is easier to package uh, for the uh, public sector to bring to bear for the private sector to create new development. And so the potential here is much greater than any of the other three lines that have been built in Minneapolis for those transit stations to be become the center of new neighborhood commercial nodes. So when we think about the commercial nodes around the city, um, Lake and Hennepin, uh, in Dinkytown, Central and Lowry, all of those transit, transit nodes um, have businesses around them. Very few of our LRT stations have commercial businesses around them. So there's a real opportunity here to do that. And the relationship, we know that the relationship of the platform to surrounding retail is critical. And that is because every transit rider, before and after they get off of the train, they are a pedestrian. And retail um, owners need pedestrians to come to their businesses. And so, um, retail, we know that retail would need someone to be able to see their business and walk easily to it from a, a station platform. And so the environment pedest uh, for pedestrians really became um, our critical um, challenge to address in the station area planning. And so um, we have been able to um, accomplish some things uh, that I think are important things we didn't know we could um, accomplish at the beginning. And I want to congratulate the project <laughs> office for being um, cooperative and collaborative with us. Um, we do have one signal pedestrian crossings for the entire uh, width of uh, all of the intersections. That means that if you get the green light on the south side, you can cross not only to the station, but to the north side in one signal. 
Um, you don't have to wait um, for two signals. Um, in addition, we got um, some crossings that are not at streets um, that would cross through the rail line. And so in those cases, PEDS will have a way to activate a light. It won't be a flashing light. It will be a red light uh, and a subsequent green light that allows pedestrians to cross through. Um, and also, we did not get bridges across the corridor. We have at-grade pedestrian crossings, which is really critical for public safety. The challenges, I, th I think we um, can be very optimistic that we will see development, particularly on the south side. And I should say that the project office also nudged the entire alignment of the roadway north um, so that the city, along with MnDOT and Minneapolis Public Housing, could take advantage of larger development parcels on the south side. The, um, the opportunity that we see uh, perhaps lost is that with um, six lanes, of traffic instead of four, um, the environment may be less hospitable to pedestrians than if there were four lanes of traffic. And that may cause developers to develop less intensity. So less intensity means uh, fewer units. And so in some measure, there's an opportunity lost there in terms of the number of possible housing units. Um, that also makes it difficult to get mixed income housing units in a development project, um, which would make it harder to address some of the communities concerns that there would not be entirely affordable housing. And I think perhaps the most important thing is that uh, with a better pedestrian environment, uh, there is a better opportunity that developers will include retail in these projects. And retail is something that is sorely needed in this part of Minneapolis. I don't have to tell you that um, we heard many times through many public meetings, folks in this neighborhood saying that they have very few choices to get anything in their neighborhood by foot. They either have to go downtown, further north, or else just leave the city entirely. So we were um, thinking that really these station areas are the opportunity to, to create some retail for the existing neighborhoods as well as any new projects that would be built there as well. And that's kind of the difference between um, six lanes and four lanes is that um, we, we don't think we'll be able to get the same intensity of development with six lanes. Does that help? Thank you. Sure. Councilmember Yang. Mr. Chair, I didn't really have uh, prepared remarks on this, but uh, with regards to this uh, talk of about the lane reductions, um, you know, myself and other council members have been in intensive uh, talks um, throughout this process. Um, and I, I can tell you that uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the final word on that was from the state of Minnesota Department of Transportation saying that, you know, that just wasn't going to happen. And so we have to work within those confines. Um, but, you know, as uh, Mr. Byer said, I mean, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, the developments that can happen there because, um, you know, he described it pretty well with regards to the Harrison neighborhood and just the challenges uh, related to commercial retail that uh, needs to happen there for it to become, you know, this vibrant, uh, self-sustaining and uh, self-supporting uh, neighborhood. Um, you know, with Southwest LRT um, on the south end and, um, you know, Botno on the north end, you know, it's it's going to be surrounded by uh, light rail, but hopefully the development uh, comes with it just um, to make it, you know, that much uh, better as a neighborhood. Uh, I, I truly appreciate um, Sean Pierce and the folks at uh, HNA for just, you know, being so engaged in this process and, um, you know, holding folks accountable and also pushing uh, the agenda of the Harris neighborhood to, you know, improve um, the neighborhood to the extent in which uh, this can be a great win for everyone, you know, with regards to the two light rail lines that are going to go through there. Um, so, you know, with with all that stuff being said, I mean, I, I, my sense is that the good folks in North Minneapolis really do want to see this uh, line go through and that uh, they want to see um, all the pluses or all the advantages that come with light rail um, come through, not only for the Harrison neighborhood, but for the neighborhood uh, north of there as well. You know, and I mean, my only regret is that uh, this line didn't cut through more of North Minneapolis so that more of North Minneapolis would benefit from it, especially, you know, let's just be honest, I mean, especially the folks up in Ward 4 even who are, you know, further away from it. But, you know, even the good folks in the Jordan neighborhood and also the Hawthorne neighborhood, uh, it doesn't touch upon those neighborhoods uh, as well as I would have liked. But, um, you know, such is life. Thank you. Any further? Conversation, Councilor Bender. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't know if anyone has moved the item. I'm happy to, to move approval of the item, but then do have a brief comment. No, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, I, I mean, I, as Councilmember Yang said, it, um, I think this is such an important project and a good investment for our city. Um, and I'm grateful for all the work that our staff has put into this and the council members in this area. I do think that this project is not realizing its full potential for the city of Minneapolis. And um, that's because we're still planning these huge transportation investments for too short a time window. We're looking at now, we're looking at 10 years in the future. Our, trans our traffic models assume that people will continue to drive at their current rates. And we know um, that if we design our transportation system to make it easy and inexpensive to drive, they will. It's called induced demand. And we're creating a transportation system that if we were really looking out 50 years and acknowledging all of the consequences of designing our road system for people to be able to drive quickly through our neighborhoods, long distances, the consequences for our climate, the consequences for our health, the consequences of urban sprawl to our region's economy, the negative impacts on city neighborhoods that see the, that daily um, traffic flow, the air pollution that our children are breathing. All of these things matter when we're making these big decisions. And so I'm disappointed that um, MnDOT was unable to be able to support more lane reduction. It's giving us missed potential for redevelopment. It's lessening our city's tax base in the future. We're building for the status quo, not for a future that um, really prioritizes transit, biking, and walking, and not for a future that prioritizes the kids in our city neighborhoods over people driving long distances. Um, and so I really, again, I'm supportive of this project. I'm glad that we've been able to come together to get to this point. Um, but I wish that when we were making these very large infrastructure investments, again, we were looking out to that 50 year future and planning for those kids in our neighborhoods um, that we uh, really need to change, change the status quo um, so that they don't continue to see the consequences of their decisions. Um, thank you. The item has been moved. Uh, do we have any further comments? Councilmember Gordon. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to be able to complain a little bit um, about the, uh, the some of the same issues. Um, and uh, interesting, while we were up here, somebody sent us an image from uh, Apple Valley of what it looks like to have transit down the middle of a seven lane uh, road. And it totally looks like a suburban concept. It totally looks like something that doesn't belong in a dense city. It totally looks like something that's never gonna get us the commercial node that we want, that we're talking about if you have this massive number of lanes. And, and we talked about six, and maybe six is tolerable, but when you look at all the intersections, it becomes seven. And for some reason, we need dedicated left turn lanes everywhere and two through lanes going, and it's not uh, where we need to go or, or where we should be going. And I, I guess I understand that it's Department of Transportation didn't want to see that happen and was concerned about it. Um, I got to hear a lot of these concerns about University Avenue when we were putting the green line down there and what's going to happen and what are we going to do and, and what's it going to mean to the city and nothing's ever going to work again. And now even when you're driving on it, it seems like things are moving smoothly and it's fine and, and there was a reduction in lanes. Um, we've seen it on many other roads where we decide to do that too. And it, and it's, and it works out fine. People um, go on their little road diet and they uh, um, figure out what to do. And maybe we need more of a massive um, effort to do that. Um, I, uh, but, um, so I would like to push back on that. I also had high hopes that we might come up with some way to do some kind of grade separation so the pedestrians could have be much more creative. And if you look down, we didn't hear the full presentation or see it, but if you look down further, um, there's apparently money to create new bridges to go over railroad tracks here and to, to get something over a, um, a freeway down there um, when, the, when the line's going on further. But when it's coming through Minneapolis and when we're worried about the Harrison neighborhood and we wanna make better connections across there, it seems like it's gotta all be at grade and we're not doing anything. Somebody did mention a pedestrian overpass and wouldn't that be wonderful? Sometimes those are tricky because people don't wanna use those and it's more time consuming to go up and over, but at least it might've been a gesture or even just down down a little for the train or the road and up if we're reconstructing the whole road, I don't know how much more it would cost, but probably something like that is a lot cheaper than having to build a new bridge for the for the trains um, over a freeway um, down the road there later. So it's, it's just frustrating. Um, it's a bit of a missed opportunity. Um, I love the idea about every tree one for one replacement and hopefully we can do that. 
maybe we can find some money along the way and some pressure along the way, or maybe if we keep talking about this, nothing's been built yet. Um, it, we're, it's okay to dream and be hopeful and optimistic. Maybe we'll see a lane disappear down down, down there somewhere before it actually gets put in. So uh, hopefully uh, if more people can talk about that and, and bring that up, um, I think I think it's great that we're building out our system and we need to. And uh, I've, I've often wished we could put conditions on our consent and I've often been told by our attorneys and others, you don't get to do that. So I guess I can't do that, but um, at least I can voice my concerns and my issues here and they can maybe be carried back and we can look at that as we move further into, into design. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further commentary? Um, I think a fair amount has been shared both in, by way of testimony from the community and comments from my colleagues. I know some of those comments fall within our range. Uh, the, the certain design approval that we have before us, subsequent design uh, that, that is uh, to follow, and even areas that are probably even outside of the project scope but are directly related to it. I think we want to make sure that these comments are heard uh, and remain instructive throughout the whole process. Um, I really want to thank the people who have came forward from the community, uh, really amounted to a very thoughtful array of considerations. And I, I think because it was so well thought out, I think it will be instructive. It will be impactful in terms of how we move forward with design. It's not built yet, as Councilman Gordon has pointed out. And uh, we do not take these uh, conversations uh, gratuitously. They are important. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for my comments, uh, comments from my colleagues and the attention by staff that's been put forward to this and will continue to do so. Um, and I should note it's been a multi department effort and I think it'll benefit from that immediate attention and, and hopefully that attention carries through because we do want to make sure that this is a multi-benefit uh, investment uh, given the dollars that are included and not looked upon solely as a siloed uh, transit infrastructure. With that, um, I will move, uh, it's been moved. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Senti name and we have passed a resolution of approval for this level of design per the municipal consent process. Thank you. I will note uh, before we were uh, joined by Council President Johnson who has been along with Council Member Yang uh, tracking this issue quite closely. And furthermore, we are also joined by uh, Assistant Director um, Lisa Cerny. Welcome. So we'll move down our agenda. We have one more public hearing um, and it's the Car Sharing per Program Ordinance. Mr. Chair. John Wurtis, Director of Transportation and Parking Services, will make the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. John Orchis, Director of Traffic and Parking Services. Um, today we have a, a public hearing and uh, ordinance adoption related to the car sharing uh, program that we're proposing on street. And I should as, uh, reiterate, uh, Mr. Chair, what you said earlier, this is uh, one of two parts uh, mm -hmm. on today's agenda. There's this item five, which is the ordinance uh, adoption efforts, and then item 13, which is about the policy. Um, so I'll be speaking to the to the ordinance to start off, but then referring to a little bit about the policy so people understand the linkages between them. Thank you. So in front of you for the ordinance is, is basically a, a culmination of a lot of efforts uh, over the past several years. Um, I should note that not only has it been staff's involvement, but also the, the three vendors, uh, car to go our car and Zipcar have all been um, at the table with us as we've learned through this pilot, pilot effort. Um, and which has brought us here today with a with the ordinance and a policy that we believe can move us forward um, um, and have an ongoing program in the city. Uh, relative to the ordinances themselves, there are basically two uh, changes which we are proposing here um, and have introduced at our last uh, last meeting here in front of you. Uh, a, a brief recap of, of those uh, ordinance changes. There are two parts to that. The first part is related to licensing. Uh, specifically in, in Title 13, Chapter 259, um, where we have created uh, a, a, a list. There's a list in there of, of licenses for, for folks, and so the uh, car share operators will be now licensed uh, in our system under this ordinance. And then second of all is the language 
um, that accompanies that that licensing um, and and the appropriate fee schedule that comes with that. Both of those are in Chapter 259. Uh, the second part of the ordinance language has to do with the permitting and the policy element. Uh, basically, the uh, in Chapter uh, in Title 18, Chapter 478, um, in the parking, stopping, and standing section. We um, introduced the parameters around uh, the policy itself and how we would move forward uh, to use uh, that in the future. Um, just a brief recap on what's in the policy. I won't get into the particulars, but there's administrative efforts. There's uh, licensing and permitting uh, provisions. There's provisions for uh, a program advisory committee to be established. Um, requirements uh, and the processes for parking on the street are in there, as well as annual reporting, as well as um, criteria and operational models, and then our, our rate structure um, relative to um, the car sharing. And then flexibility, hopefully in the future, uh, we sure don't expect that we've caught everything today, but we will uh, proceed forward with that. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I'll, I'll keep it brief in that sense and um, be open to comments or questions that come up during the public hearing. Thank you. Um, any questions per presentation? Uh, seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Uh, we do have someone signed in. Uh, we'll begin with Brian Harvey. Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Good morning. My name is Brian Harvey and I am the Zipcar Market Manager in Minneapolis. Our office is at 733 Marquette Avenue South. Thank you, Chair Reich and members of the committee for allowing me to uh, ref uh, go over a few prepared comments here today. Zipcar is the world's largest car sharing network with operations in over 500 cities and towns in eight countries around the world. We were founded 16 years ago, a time when car sharing seemed crazy, with a clear social mission to enable simple and responsible urban living. And that mission is strengthened by our partnerships with the cities where we operate, including here in Minneapolis, where we launched in 2013, and to 